Hello and welcome to thanks to everybody who's joining us today from all around the world. We have people tuning in from the Philippines, from Brazil, India, the UK, the US. Uh, I'm Asad Raymond. I'm the executive director of War on One. I'm one of the co-coordinators of the Global Green New Deal project, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Before I introduce our panelists, I want to just thank the organizers and the sponsors of this teaching, War on Want and Leap and our sponsor Haymarket Books. Please do visit their websites, like their videos, follow them on social media, and of course, buy lots of books and subscriptions to support everybody's ongoing work. Haymarket in particular is a fiercely independent and radical publisher of incredible authors, including Angela Davis, Naomi Klein, Aaron Dutty Roy, and so many others. And if there's ever a time for bold radical ideas, now is it, and we need to support our independent publishers and bookstores. So before we begin, I just want to start with a little bit of housekeeping. With so many people, we may need your patience if we have any technical issues. If your stream gets choppy at any time, you might want to reduce your image quality and that might help. Um, this video is going to be recorded and will be shared afterwards uh, on the YouTube channel. And we are, of course, reserving time for a Q&A. So please pause your questions in the live video feed. Where, wherever you're watching it, or you can tweet us at Global GND using the hashtag, hashtag Global GND, and we'll pick up those uh, questions and uh, uh, we'll have an opportunity to ask both uh, Naomi and Aaron Dutty. And of course, um, the live event will be also available to download and that link will be emailed to you. So housekeeping over, I, I won't let's go. And uh, it's my real pleasure to bring in two people who continually inspire, educate, and give me hope, as they do, I'm sure, for many of us. Uh, Aaron Dutty Roy, uh, who lives in Delhi, she is the author of the novels The God of Small Things, for which re she received the 1997 Booker Prize, and The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. A collection of her essays from the past 20 years, My Seditious Heart, was recently published by Haymarket Books. I have to say it's brilliant. And in September, Haymarket will publish her new book of essays, Azadi, Freedom, Fascism, Fiction. Naomi Klein, well, is, is also an award-winning journalist, columnist, and is author of the New York Times and international bestseller, bestsellers, The Shock Doctrine, No Logo, This Changes Everything, No Is Not Enough, and of course her recent book, On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. Naomi is the inaugural Glory Steinem Endowed Chair in Media, Culture and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University, and she's also the co-founder of the Climate Justice Organization, The Leap, and I'm proud to say a long-time friend and patron of War on Want as well. Before I turn to our two guests, I want to just say a few words about the Global Green New Deal project. Uh, Leap and War on Want are calling for a Global Green New Deal project, and it's an invitation to a really a collaborative and radical process to reimagine and transform our world. We believe we can move from crisis justice, justice while leaving no one behind. The LEAP's mission is to make... Suddenly hear an echo. Jump. I'm hoping that... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll carry on and I hope it just goes away. It did. Leap, it did. Mm -hmm. The LEAP's mission uh, is to make system change irrist irresistible and to bring to life the world we deserve. LEAP believes the best way to tackle the climate catastrophe is by building movement power and popular support for a more just world. War and One, one of the other organisers, exists to fight against the root causes of poverty, human rights violations and climate injustice. Throughout its history, it's been part of the movement for global justice. It works directly with frontline movements and communities both in the global south and has never been afraid to speak truth to power here in the global north. Together, without all of our global partners, we're building a movement rooted in the spirit of internationalism for a global Green New Deal that connects the fight against climate crisis, the corona pandemic, neoliberalism, and the legacy of race, empire, and imperialism. We know that today's corona pandemic has simply exposed the existing inequalities that exist in our world. Here in the global north, it's the poorest, most vulnerable black and brown communities that face a virus that has not been a great leveler but has simply exposed the structural, economic and health inequalities. Whilst in the global south, half of its citizens have already been condemned to poverty. Billions are denied access to energy, water, a living wage, public services, the very building blocks for not just the right to a dignified life, but the ability to be able to deal with the corona pandemic. It's a world that has been built on sacrificing the global south in an art history that can connect slavery, colonialism, 
to neoliberal capitalism. And in the midst of this deeply unequal world, climate change has thrown a ticking bomb. We all know that billions already face killer floods, droughts and famines, and that we have less than a decade before we breach the critical 1.5 degree guardrail that will trigger tipping points that will leave billions more losing their homes and livelihoods. If there was ever a time for a vision for the future, now is it. And I'm so honoured that we have two such foremost thinkers to help us think about what that vision is. So let me start by asking both Naomi and Aaron Dutty. Um, we, are, as a, we often hear that we're, we're, of course, in this multiple crisis, a crisis of hunger, poverty, health, of climate violence, racism, patriarchy, and all in the midst of our very life systems failing. And it's, as a result, we often hear this common refrain, we need system change. And interestingly, this call isn't just only from progressive circles. We've even seen the Financial Times publishing articles saying nothing less than a rethink of how the world does business is needed. So the starting point of any vision, of course, is understanding what is it we want to change. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on what system change is and from what. So let me start with Naomi. Well, sure. Um, hi, everybody. I am so happy to be in conversation with two of my favorite people in the world. Um, and I'm really moved by the number of people who have tuned in um, and, and, and wanted to be part of this. And I really want to stress that even though we've all done lots of webinars um, and, and, and teach-ins, um, we're trying to do something a little bit different here. This is, as Asad mentioned, an invitation to be part of a process. Um, and originally there was going to be a big in-person gathering in London. Um, we had an incredible lineup of speakers and um, I'm not gonna list them all because it's just gonna make us sad that we didn't get to, get to be together. Um, but it grew out of a critique, I think quite a legitimate critique of the conversations that were happening about green, various Green New Deals in the UK and in the US and in Canada, where this idea that actually came from the global south. Um, when, I, when I wrote This Changes Everything, I began with a quote from Angelica Navarro, Boliv uh, Bolivia's then um, one of Bolivia's climate negotiators, um, calling for a Marshall Plan for planet Earth, a redistribution of, of resources on a scale never be seen before, um, recognizing the debt that was owed from the north to the south and really seizing on the climate crisis and the fact that we can quantify who warmed this planet because we know where the carbon came from over uh, several hundred years um, as an invitation to build a more just world or to set the world right side up um, as, uh, as, as um, the, the late great uh, um, author Eduardo Galeano might have told us in a moment like this. Um, and yet, despite these roots um, and, and groundwork laid by organizations like Acción Arqueológica, who were going to be participating in the Global Green New Deal um, gathering, in some ways, the Global South had dropped off the, off the, the radar uh, of many of the people talking about a Green New Deal in the North. So um, on the one hand, we saw progress being made because we weren't talking about a narrow carbon-based climate policy that was just about um, you know, having cap and trade or something like that. Um, and it was talking about industrial policy and, um, and really the next economy we want. We were hearing all kinds of nationalist framings creep in, like we need you know, economic patriotism and we're gonna win the race with China in green tech and things like that. And then we'll dump a whole bunch of cheap solar panels on the, on the global south and call it justice. And it really wasn't reckon, rec reckoning some of this with the logics of growth and endless so-called progress um, and the history of colonialism, as you said, Assad. And so the idea around this gathering, this process, um, was to um, was to begin to have a more participatory, a more democratic uh, a conversation um, that included many more voices from the global south. And so that process has now moved online. Assad has mentioned the various organizations that are involved, but I really want to 
um, urge um, those of you who are tuning in today to not be only spectators to this process, but really to plug in, to follow the, the links. Um, uh, you know, on Twitter, we've got the global GN, GND, GN deal uh, um, handle where you can follow this or follow War on One or The Leap just to stay involved because we're going to try to do digital digitally um, some of what we were going to be doing in person. That was going to be happening anyway in parallel. And of course, there will come a time when we'll be able to gather again in person in our communities to feed into a global process. And there's a, never, you know, a, a, a um, <clears throat> An in-person conference is always going to be limited anyway. So maybe we'll end up with a process that is more decentralized and more, more inclusive anyway. So um, that's, that's where this, what this comes out of. And I think where we are, you know, in answering and trying to begin to answer this challenge, Assad, um, which I don't feel like I can <laughs> or anyone can really, what is the system that needs changing um, it goes by, you know, we, we all know the names, right? We are, you know, we, we are talking about the violence of a capitalist system. Um, we are talking about an extractivist logic um, that treats both the earth itself, individual places, and entire groups of people as disposable. Um, so it's a logic of endless extraction and disposal um, that really cherishes nothing and no one. Um, and at The Leap, we talk about moving from that logic to a logic of care and repair, caring for the earth and, and one another, right? These are, these are slogans. <laughs> these are, you know, little catchphrases. Um, but one of the things that I think is really striking about the moment that we're in right now um, with this pandemic is, you know, the roar of workers who are on the front lines who are talking about being simultaneously essential and disposable, or simultaneously essential and sacrificial, right? And so if we think about the, that arc of history um, and, and the, the fissures and injustices uh, um, that created this crisis and the climate crisis itself, it was always built on the idea of essential and the, the, the simultaneity of the essential and the sacrificial, right? If we think about the earliest inputs to the colonial project, stolen land and stolen bodies of African slaves, of indigenous land, um, the essential was always treated as sacrificial. Its essentialness was always denied, right? So I think that cuts very deep into what it is that needs changing, that, that the sickness of the system, um, and maybe hints at the world that we need to build that is founded in treating no one um, as if they are sacrificable and nowhere, right? It begins with cherishing um, and builds from there. Um, and then I would just hand it over to the much more eloquent and brilliant Arundhati Roy, who I'm so happy to be, to be looking at right now and now to be hearing from. Hello, my friend. <laughs> yes, Naomi, it's lovely to see you. Um, you know, I don't want to repeat uh, what Naomi has said because obviously I, I, I imagine that most of the people who are listening in agree with this. You know, um, I, I, I'll talk about um, things that are things that I don't have answers for, but things that I'm thinking about and worrying about, you know. Um, yes, uh, the, the coronavirus has, uh, perhaps it's it, obviously it's not the first pandemic in the world the, or the, what the world has ever known, but perhaps the first pandemic in this whatsapp eyes digital age you know where uh, where there's no interface between uh, you know media anchors and every kind of virologist and epidemiologist and uh, mathematical model maker and and so you know what is happening is in, in new york and the way it's being dealt with in new york 
is is within seconds uh, being dealt with in India in the same way when the pro- when the problems the medical problems the health issues the strategic ways of dealing with that ought to be totally different you know so there's a there's a there's a kind of breakdown of the whole world that we've seen now i mean there is uh, the 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 machine of capitalism has come to a halt and that is creating a kind of panic where there are people like us talking about one kind of way of looking at how to use this moment to bring people to their senses and there's another uh, 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 situation in which the chess men are being moved around so fast while we are all locked down and um, I just wondered you know um, I, I just was reading about how they have uh, they're about to sign over a big uh, elephant sanctuary with a lot of rare plants and rare birds in in the state of Assam uh, to over to coal mining. Coal mining has just been privatized. Everything is being privatized now to deal with this crisis. So exactly the opposite of what we want to happen is happening very fast. But but when we talk about cherishing and when we talk about passion and when we talk about the people who have been affected, you know, for so many years here in India, there have been such great ferocious, beautiful, militant movements, uh, uh, you know, raising all these issues with a different language, obviously, you know, because those movements have actually come from the ground and they have said all the things that we are saying, which essentially, to put it in in a sentence, is as- was asking the world to redefine the meaning of progress to redefine the meaning of civilization, to redefine the meaning of happiness, you know? Do you really need to, 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 to treat the earth like a resource in order to call yourself civilized? So, so we had a different idea of, 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 I mean, the people that were fighting had a different idea. But at the same time, you know, I, I think what really worries me is now that Let's say in the state of Assam, where the elephant sanctuary is going to be handed over to coal mining, it's a state where people have, have like since the 70s, you know, fought uh, uh, such, I mean, there's been such a huge movement there against what people think of as foreigners, you know, people who have come in from Bangladesh, whatever. It's a it's a very vexed issue over there. It has been for a long time, and you can't just uh, you can't just demonize what's going on. But that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, the passions that that kind of nationalistic identity um, arouses in people, that same passion doesn't translate onto the defense of the land you know so how do we make that so how how do we as people who are thinking about how to mount this resistance because ultimately we 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 i think are at a stage where those who agree with us agree with us and that includes a huge um, amount of young people we're not going to be able to persuade the people in, um, you know, the corporate CEOs or the fossil fuel industry. We're not going to be able to persuade them. We have to force them. We have to. So, so we have to rally ourselves. <coughs> and what, what are those pressure points? You know, why have we? As I mean, my perspective and my understanding, of course, uh, is is pretty much rooted in this part of the world. And I keep thinking, you know, in the 60s, there were huge movements, ideological and revolutionary movements, demanding the redistribution of land, the redistribution of wealth, the call for revolution. And from the 60s to now, it became 
first a call for revolution, then it became just, uh, you know, when the anti-dam movements and the anti-displacement movements started, just leave whatever little land people have, indigenous people or people who live on the riverbank, don't displace them. Let's just leave us with what little we have. And even that has been pushed back, you know. Mm. So we are we're we're left with a language of justice which has been reduced to talk of human rights we are left with the language in which they adjudicate you know so uh, i think we are in i mean the real crisis we face is how do we we understand but how do we <laughs> mobilize and and you know uh, how do we become militant about what we want and what we believe in? Because truly the, the next generation is going to be devastated. If people think coronavirus is a problem, it's a stuffed toy compared to clim- the climate crisis that's coming, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Or, the, or the intersection of the two, right? Which is, yes. which is what we're, 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 we're getting a glimpse of right now um, with a fierce cyclone. Um, uh, already hitting the Bay of Bengal. Um, yeah. And just a couple of things I would, 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 would love to, to, to build on. Um, one is just, I think, that we need to be honest that we are in a moment where liberalism has failed us, right? And just, you know, the, the sort of liberal, liberal, human rights discourse here, um, the professionalized NGO architecture, the siloing of crises into their own little boxes, you know, human rights over here, migration over there, environment over here, racism over here, feminism over here, that has failed us. The world is um, (laughs) defying that in real time as all of these crises intersect um, and what was bad before the crisis of the coronavirus becomes absolutely unbearable, unlivable in the midst of it on so many fronts that I'm not going to delineate here. But but that that is you know I think that that's the whole idea of a of a of a green new deal framing and in particular one that is trying to break down nationalist discourses is. Um, we can't think like that anymore. And there's a whole history that trained generations to think like that because I think of the real threat of the people's movements that you're talking about, Arundhati, that do, that were demanding um, those the revolution, uh, making revolutionary demands, making core demands about redistribution of land and, and resources. Um, and, and that created something a lot safer and created a context where... Um, you know, progressives, liberals, whatever you want to call them, who tend to live in cities. And, you know, I always quote Arundhati saying, you know, the environmental movement for too long has asked the question, how do we change without changing, right? Um, Which is, you know, a a challenging, more challenging question, the longer you sit with it, right? Um, And, and, and that is a world that for that has a bad track record of standing with the movements that are most directly impacted by these violent logics of extraction, whether of the earth or people or both at the same time, um, and maligning those movements and critiquing them and just the, for, for their lack of perfection in key moments, right? Um, and you know, this is something that I've always really appreciated about Arundhati's writing um, and politics of, of standing with those movements that have been vilified by liberals in these moments. And and the reason why I underline this, and Assad, you know, you and I have both been part of political projects in recent years. You know, you in the UK with Corbyn and 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 me as part of the, the Sanders campaign, where you have political projects that are being powered by more working class um, uh, um, parts of, 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 of society and of the left um, and, and a cert, sort of a liberal elite saying no way, you know, um, and, and those doors shut, 
right? And 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 now you know we're in a moment where we, we we're weaker than we should be, certainly in 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 the UK and in the US because these openings were not seized. Um, you know, like <laughs> there was this thing going on on social media a couple of days ago where it was like post the last picture that were th- in your phone where things were normal, right? Quote unquote normal before the pandemic. And I looked at my phone and every single one of them was a Bernie Sanders rally. And I just couldn't bear to post it, you know, because it's just, it's too heartbreaking. But what, one of the things that really strikes me when I, you know, when I think about why I, why I decided to throw in for Bernie, and I, I think this is relevant because Bernie's campaign really had embraced the, the, the global Green New Deal framing and you know, it wasn't perfect, but it was connecting it with militarism, was talking about moving trillions from the military budget to a global Green New Deal that would have massive redistribution of wealth from North to South, $200 billion as part of that, um, as part of that redistribution. And if you look at who the biggest donors, small donors to the Sanders campaign were, they were Amazon workers, <laughs> um, nurses, um, teachers, um, the, and, and, and so many of the people whose work is now being recognized as essential, right? So they were already being disrespected. And so I find myself thinking, you know, so if there's this group of people who are being labeled essential and are being treated as sacrificial, then there's this other group of people who are at home, like us, right, who have the luxury of, 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 of isolation. So what are we if we're not essential, right? <laughs> like, are we superfluous? Are we being, like, kept like pets? For who? Like, what? What is our role? Those of us well, who have this luxury. Me, of me, I, yeah. I just want to. I mean, just because of the overwhelming horror that is happening here right now, I, I wanted to say when you say who are we, you know, that um, what, while I was talking about one of the one of the ways in which the what we are talking now of as climate change and about the climate crisis, one of the ways many years ago, 20 years ago, when people were fighting on the ground, of course they were not using these words, but they were fighting big dams, they were fighting mining, they were fighting deforestation. And they were, and and where did the power of those fights come from? They came from the idea that people were being displaced in their hundreds of thousands, sometimes in their millions, you know, by these big projects, which were then directly, you could see people being pushed off their lands and forced into into big cities. So, you know, the non-Hindu fascist government, the pro-neoliberal Congress government had a vision where they wanted India to be urbanized. They wanted like 70% of the, you know, it was, it used to be 80% rural, 20% urban. And uh, and there was this uh, push of people to be now arriving as pools of cheap labor in, in cities, hidden in these tenements and uh, working as more or less slave labor in, in, in uh, you know, the garment industry and the construction. And now, uh, when Modi announced the the lockdown, 1.38 billion of us were locked down with four hours notice. So all the world has seen the, the pictures of the exodus of millions of stranded workers. They are now those same people who were pushed out of their villages by these 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 projects, which are exactly what we are opposing now, moved into the cities. And now there, there's this massive reverse migration because they do not exist in the imagination of this country anymore. They, the poor were simply erased. They were erased in literature. They were erased in cinema. They were erased in politics, except when you start looking at voter booth counts and all that. And, and suddenly they reappeared now. And what we are witnessing every day here is is millions of people walking hundreds of kilometers hungry without water without food without money and and the answer to this is more privatization more mining more deforestation uh why because this is how you're going to 
power back the economy you know so your uh, your your i mean i can only i don't know we don't even know what the contours this we we roughly know the contours of the crisis we don't know the horror we don't know the texture of it we don't know the depth of it but the chaos is 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 on the level honestly of some kind of crime against humanity i mean sometimes i think you really need the covid trials you know to tell us what are these structural things that are going on while this while this uh, well it's i keep using the word biblical but the bible has not seen such numbers you know this kind of Uh, you know even the people who are close in their homes i don't think can sleep at night thinking what have we done who are we you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, combine that with the uh, with the uh, with the fa- uh, hindu fascist islamophobia the detention centers being built the muslim anti muslim citizenship law so and and you have while these millions of people have no transport no no way to get home hundreds of miles away you have the 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 indians who were stranded abroad being you know flown back in sanitized planes almost as though preparations are being made to separate the walking classes from the flying classes forever like a class apartheid you know we had a caste apartheid we have a religious apartheid and now a class apartheid where you have this touchless uh future you know uh and 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 what's going to happen to the to the bulk of the workers of the world you know some of them will continue to work of course but the interface between the between the you know the flying classes will actually be hermetically sealed you know so i i used to say that you had the india's middle and upper classes have fought the most successful secessionist struggle in the world where they seceded into outer space and they look down and say what's our coal doing in your fields and what's our water doing in your rivers and what's our timber doing in your forest but now that's you know so you can't really think of countries anymore you think of elites and then another world and covid is making it really a hermetically sealed i just want to pick up on on those points i mean we'll come back to i think the important point that you raised about power and how do we build power rally power i i i think you know as nami said i mean one of the you know one of the positive transformations that we've seen at least in some of the movements in the global north is has been this push to move them away from the carbon logic and of course you know we've seen some new movements being growing and and we're grateful for them but i i i i think very much as you, as in the what you said Aaron Dutty that you know the one of the problems i think has been that the that this lack of both historical analysis and understanding of class does it means that some sometimes when we we're analyzing the problem we're still only looking to seek to dial back you know that some people want to dial back the global north to a point where you know maybe income was redistributed a little bit more fairly amongst people where maybe there was a bit more state control of resources but the idea of sacrificing and sacrificing large parts of both the class in the global north and overwhelming the global side it still remains a very central part of of that logic and i think you know going forward the the need for political education to understand as you said the popular movements that we had and what they fought for and why some were defeated you know because of interventions whether we talk about lumumba in congo or mossadegh in iran or benz in guatemala the the hopes that there were in many countries for a different reality coming out of the anti-colonial struggles were all snuffed out largely because of again of the control of resources and and the new logic of of neo-colonialism and imperialism but i i i know both of you talk about you know this moment about the possibilities of transformation mm. and the and the re, and a possible different re- future from this current reality i think 
Arundhati, you said, you know, Corona is an X-ray on society. And, and of course, it's the title of today's webinar as well, Into the Portal and Leave No One Behind. And, you know, thinking about portals and, in, you know, I'm a lover of sci-fi and in sci-fi and in mm-hmm. classic literature, you know, from Alice in Wonderland to Witch, Lion, Witch in the Wardrobe, the idea of the portal is, you know, it's two different future. And it's something that has always been a feature of both of your writings, actually. In, in your essay, I think in 2001 in Power Politics, you talked about these two convoys, you know, a small convoy to a glittering destination, and this other convoy that's going to melt us into darkness. And, and Naomi, you in Shock Doctrine, of course, you, you know, it was so powerful. You wrote about how this crisis produces, how crisis produces real change. And it's when the crisis occurs that actions are taken, depend on the ideas that are lying around. And that one of our roles and our basic function is to develop these alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive until, I think you said, the political... No, I didn't say any of this. Milton Friedman said that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, oh, sorry. Well, yeah, you, 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 you quoted and said Milton Friedman said all of this. Sorry, my, my writing on that. I, I wanted to just talk about if we would talk us through this portal, if we went through a portal and we could actually genuinely lift off the shackles of our imagination and, and, and imagine a diff, very different world, um, I mean, what could that look like? Because, you know, often I think even th- at the height of our imagination, and one of the things that neoliberalism has done is taken away our imagination to believe or to imagine something different. We limit our imagination to tinkering around the edges. And of course, I think the moment of these multiple crises, we can no longer tinker around the edges. So I suppose this is an open moment for, for you know, is there a possible vision, all possible visions of the future? And, and what should be the foundations of those? Um, I'll, I'll ask you, Aaron Dutty, first. Well, there, there are... Um Obviously, you know, it's a very vast uh, question and mm-hmm. and and um, I don't know from where I can start to answer it. But yes, um, I think I think the, 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 the main the main thing is really to change our imagination. I mean, when I come to Europe and, and the US, uh, when I travel there, I I do feel very, um, I mean, people keep asking me, you know, why do you live in India? This is so much horror. But there's also a wilderness of the imagination here still. There's also places where the possibility of a different way of living and a different way of thinking and a different way of understanding what civilization could be still exists really, I mean, in reality. But I would say that one of the one of the most profound uh, um, you know moments when i when i when i thought as a writer how do i how do i answer this question is something that i wrote in one of the essays a while ago i was traveling in uh, uh, the state of orissa where you know there's a lot of bauxite and there's a lot of bauxite mining so the bauxite mountains are these porous rock mountains, you know, flat mountains, which for the people around, they function as water tanks. Bauxite holds the water and then it waters the plains below, uh, very fertile plains, you know. And then you have these uh, mining companies who, 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 who are for whom the bauxite in the mountain means nothing. It only is only valuable when you take it out of the mountain, whereas for the people there, it's only valuable when it's in the mountain, doing what it's meant to do in nature, you know. So I thought, when will we be able to have an imagination that allows you to leave the bauxite in the mountain, you know, because that is the beginning of a a, a domino effect. Once you understand that you just can't extract everything that things are finite, then your genius, there is no doubt that the human race is a genius race, but your genius moves towards thinking differently, not thinking of the bauxite out of the mountain, but the bauxite in the mountain. Then you move towards 
respecting the land. What is it that grows on this land that nourishes the people here? Not what mm. co cash crop can I grow and send to Canada, you know? Can you look at the food on your plate and not have frequent flyer miles on it? You know, can it just be, because that, that's how people like me did grow up, you know? I mean, when I grew up in Kerala, everything on my plate was really literally from within a one kilometer radius, you know, whether it was the fish or the rice or the bamboo pole you caught, it was, and it was fine. No one was suffering, you know, so a, a different imagination, going through the portal would be to say that, you know, change doesn't mean you're going to necessarily suffer. It could be so much more beautiful, you know, to be, in a place where you respect, uh, not you not you don't have a psychotic relationship with the earth that you want to despoil it and destroy it, but and to your fellow human beings too, it's a great relief. It's mm -hmm. a great relief to respect the earth and to have a more equal relationship with people. And 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 for this, I just want to say that, you know, we do. We do know that our enemies are on the right and they are the CEOs and so on. But also, I mean, speaking from uh, my experience in India, the left has, the, the, by the left, I mean, in India, the left isn't the American left. It's a regular, real communist left, left or it considers itself to be. But it has also failed. It has also failed to understand what women want. It has failed to understand caste. It has failed to understand the environment in so many ways. And so, so you do need a new and more wholesome ideological approach to carry. I mean, why, does, why did Bernie eventually not get nominated? You know, it wasn't only because of the, uh, of the neoliberal Democrats. You know, he also didn't carry, I think, a lot of people, a lot of African-Americans, you know, who feel left out of the conversation in some ways. We have to include everybody in this understanding of what justice looks like. Only then the siloization, mm. uh, those walls will break down, you know, only when you can't just get away by saying caste is class comrade. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's more than that, you know? So uh, I think we have a lot of work, I mean, to, to understand how to build solidarities uh, on our side also, you know? It's not just, because the other side is, 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 is never going to be with us. I mean, we don't have to waste too much time trying to convince them. It's, 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 it's about rallying those who understand and agree, but, have to feel the passion uh, for each other, you know? Absolutely. And I think, uh, I mean, two important reflections there. One, you know, of course, about the environmental limits. And, you know, it's often really disappointing to see so much of even the progressive movement in the global north not understand those environmental limits when they talk about, you know, transforming the global north through resource extraction, even the visions of the future in 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 the UK and and Europe and, and North America, you know, are, are simply going to ignite a new wave of devastating extraction of minerals and metals. And I've always been struck about the lack of imagination to think about something different, rather than thinking that the answer is going to be in electric batteries. And some of it, mm -hmm. it clearly is. We need to just remember the fights we had about the commons, about energy, land, food and water being seen as the commons owned by people. I have, a, I, have to, I have to tell you a lovely little poem about the commons. Please. It was, uh, what was, uh, no, let me remember it, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, well, well, let me just turn to, to Naomi. Um, yeah, I, the law locks up, the law locks up the hapless felon that steals the goose from off the common, but lets the greater felon loose who steals the common from the goose. <laughs> <laughs> so, Naomi, over to you for some poetry now. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I, I, I, I wanted to just, before you start answering that, I wanted to also ask you specifically, I know you shared many of the critiques about resource extraction, and you talk a lot about, you know, we need to think about what the new economy looks like, the care economy. And I, I just would specifically wanted to ask you in that, in that context also, you know, we're hearing a lot of conversations now about a just recovery, about the future of work, democratization of work. And, and when you look at it in, you know, the impending global recession where it said that half of all the jobs in the global south are about to be lost, where already 70% of workers barely survive in the informal economy. I, I, I want to wonder whether you can, you can maybe paint a bigger picture of, of, of how do we build a vision of a of an economy where you know is, is it universal basic income is it access mm. to public service is it breaking it down to saying social protection and workers rights to the foundation or do we need to have a much more profound conversation about what is the economy for mm -hmm. i think it is that question what is the economy f for and i think that we are in a malleable moment, right? Where, you know, whenever we have these moments and, and, and we seem to have them more frequently, um, where capitalism is just wildly breaking its own rules in broad daylight, right? We saw it after the 2008 financial crisis and we are now seeing it again. That creates an opening, but, uh, um, but the opening is brief, right? Um, where, if we have the confidence and you know, coming to that you know, Milton Friedman quote, right, only a crisis real or perceived produces real change. It's interesting. That I think that Friedman's fascination and actually fear of moments of crisis was built on an understanding that previous profound economic crises, in particular, the market crash of 1929, had produced everything that he hated about um, redistribution of wealth in, in his own country, right? It produced the New Deal. And if we understand neoliberalism really as a, as, a, um, as, as a class war to dismantle the gains of working people in the aftermath of the, um, or in the midst of the Great Depression in the aftermath of the Second World War, it, it explains the shock doctrine. The shock doctrine is a way of preventing moments of crisis from being seized by regular people, by working people, to demand real fixes to, the, to, the, to what those crises reveal, to the unveilings. And um, you know, I often think in this moment of friends that I met in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, where, who talk about Hurricane Maria as an unveiling, uh, unveiling um, all of these pre-existing crises and vulnerabilities, including, you know, Arundhati was talking about uh, an imagination that allowed for thinking that we could be, be happy um, with food that we had grown ourselves, grown locally. Um, you know, these shocks to our system produce the, um, the realization of just how vulnerable we are because of the logics of capitalist globalization, which creates these incredibly long supply chains um, that are highly centralized, highly, you know, so for Puerto Rico, all of their food was coming, you know, almost all, around 90, more than 90% of, of the food in uh, to an island or an archipelago of islands that were incredibly fertile, um, was all was being imported through a single port, much of it coming from a single port in Florida. And both those ports were hit by two different hurricanes, right? So, you know, we talk about food and food security, and that can seem like jargon and abstraction until the moment that your port where all your food is coming through gets knocked out, or the electricity that is coming from centralized sources gets knock, knocked out. And so these these alternatives that have been kept alive um, in large part by indigenous um, movements around the world, saving seeds, saving knowledge, um, protecting ways of living with the earth that were much less vulnerable to being knocked out in a moment, um, now don't you know, look um, like a, you know, just a sort of a, a silly old fashioned way of living, but actually a much more um, much, much more intelligent way of surviving a future that is going to be marked by many more shocks, right? So when we talk about 
um, the portal, right? I mean, I, I, we're not talking about a sunny utopia, right? Like we're talking about how we survive um, a future that is going to have many more of these um, of, of this staccato shocks before the last one was in any way resolved. And we're, we're seeing it right now. We're entering into hurricane season. We will still be in a pandemic when that, those hurricanes um, are, start pummeling island nations, start pummeling coastal cities. Um, so how are we going to live together Right. What is going to allow us to hold on to our humanity, to not lock down, to not fear strangers? And I think we need to be building in, um, you know, I sometimes talk about shock absorbers, but it's really about resisting the logic of that brutal efficiency that doesn't leave any slack in the system. Right. So every time there's any kind of hit, you know, there's no beds in the hospital. There's no food. There's no food reserves. There's no water. Right. Because the, the logic of capitalist efficiency makes sure that there's no slack in the system. So we need a much more bountiful logic because that's actually what's going to allow us to survive. And we need that when it comes to food. We need redundancies, right? Nature has all of these brilliant redundancies built in um, because we know that there are shocks. But capitalism has been taking out all the redundancies um, so that we are um, so vulnerable every time we have one of these shocks. I just want to, you know, one of the reasons why I find um, the the metaphor of the portal so important, right, is that it is a reminder that we are going somewhere different, right? That doesn't, that does by no means necessarily means it's better. And I think we all agree mm -hmm. that it's more likely to be worse, right? But what we aren't doing is going back to where we were before. Like we are in a in a period of seismic shift. And I think one of the things that is rad potentially radicalizing in a good way about this moment, you know, Arundhati was talking about the, 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 the rich, um, uh, um, uh, you know, declaring independence really from the rest of the world um, and, and living a kind of a hermetically sealed luxury existence, right? I mean, I don't think it can ever be hermetically sealed because there will always be hands that pack the boxes, that do the, the pick the food. That is not going to be automated. But what capitalism no. will be better at doing is hiding the hands. Yes. Right? So we are, we're actually in a moment where the two worlds um, are butting up against each other in a, 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 a more closely and with more porousness, we are seeing each other, like because of this unveiling to mix metaphors, right? Um, we are seeing and thinking about the hands that, that, that make our lives possible. We who are part of the lockdown class, the isolate, you know, whatever but, you want to call it. And so, you know, just to finish this thought, right? Um, how, how do we maintain that? Because what Silicon Valley is in the midst of doing is figuring out very, very quickly how to hide the hands, right? What they're, they're repackaging so-called frictionless technologies or seamless technologies as now touchless technologies, right? So you're going to get your Amazon packages by drone and or driverless vehicle. And they're going to, you know, they're talking about how they're eliminating touch points in all of this. And so uh, there's a massive rebranding campaign. I'm calling it the Screen New Deal. Um, but it, it's all an illusion because all it is about is hiding the hands and the touch that we will never be able to be freed from, right? And so in this moment where we're recognizing the, the pandemic as a crisis, you know, down the road, it could just be that we're just like, find a way to live with 3000 people a day dying in the United States from the pandemic and that just gets normalized. Now we're calling that a crisis. This is, this is, this is a moment what, that we have to build upon, right? Where this is a moment where, like, the front page of the New York Times uh, is, you know, featuring a corpse with a gloved hand, you know, performing last rites. And then there's a new section of the New York Times on Sundays called At Home, How We Live Now. And it's all about, you know, quarantine lifestyle, sourdough recipes, camping with your kids in the backyard how to have a stay staycation, wonderful things you can get ordered to your home, 
what to watch on streaming video, right? So it's tur- it's already turning the pandemic into a luxury lifestyle, yes, right? right? Right. And 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 those hands, and I'm borrowing a lot of this from my partner Avi Lewis. Um, um, and, you know, and we're all building on work that lots of people are doing and our mutual friend, V. E. Wenzler has been writing about the, you know, the, the, the way in which touch is being disappeared. Um, but how do we, how do we, I feel like our political task now is to not let the hands disappear and to keep open the spaces where we see through these portals, right? Before everybody, all of it gets disappeared forever. Sure. In- in in india you know it's impossible to make it disappear because it's you know it's everywhere but because here you have a i mean here you have a society that has in from ancient times practiced untouchability has created a caste of people who are untouchable you know so here, here people are going around saying, see, we do namaste, we never touch people. Even the New York Times had a thing about how great it is. Coronavirus hasn't spread in India because people do namaste, which is, you know, whatever it is. But the, the fact is that in India, um, we, we've lived with Ill, we live with illness. Like in India, somehow the, the, the virus at least according to official figures, has behaved very differently to how it has behaved in Europe and the U.S. So uh, though it arrived here the same time as it arrived in the U.S., there are 3,000 deaths officially recorded for corona. But in that same time, you know, from January 30th to now, if you extrapolate public data, I mean uh, uh, medical data, you have 150,000 people have died of that other uh, respiratory infectious disease called tuberculosis. But it has been made the disease of the poor. And corona will be too. You know, it will become, we were all told we are battling it. It's a war. It's a war. But now the, the, the language is you have to learn to live with it. But in other words, the poor have to learn to live with it. And the poor will labor. They will not be protected. And the turnover will be acceptable. That's that's that the turnover of bodies or whatever you're talking about, you know. But here in India, a lockdown could never be a lockdown. I mean, yesterday there are thousands. I mean, tens of thousands of people just just uh, you know in stations and bus stops just trying to get home. They say we'll we'll go home and die. We don't want to die here in the city, you know. But they don't want to die. Who wants to die? You know, but they have nowhere to go. They have no space, as I said, in anybody's imagination. So, uh, so, so touchless, it, what, what I said was that hands won't go away, but there will be class apartheid, you know, mm-hmm. where you really uh, create a, a world which is separate. Where, where I mean, it's a, it's, it's the same thing. The middle and upper classes secede into outer space, and the others labor for them. You know, but um, it's the, the only thing is that here, a hundred and twenty, no, one hundred and thirty-five thousand people before the COVID crisis hit. India had India was the unemployment was at a forty-five year high. And now 135 million jobs have been lost. You know, so what is the, what are the contours of this crisis and how are they going to be dealt with? Maybe by just making people hate Muslims more and lynch Muslims more. And I don't know, how is it going to, how is it going to play out? I don't know. uh, Picking up on that point, I mean, obviously both of you uh, in totally different realities and you both write very differently but you sp- clearly talk about these global realities and Naomi living in the US, if you in India and you've both spoken a lot about this rise of, of fascism, supreme right, right-wing nationalism, of populism and it's, it's, it's a moment isn't it that the crisis of chaos hasn't necessarily produced the movements or the popular support for progressive ideals. In fact, 
it's the right who've often benefited in many, many countries. And, um, and, and thinking about this moment of crisis of also the likelihood of what, of entering the darkness, I mean, is it more just a, a deeper corporate state, corporate state? Is it more surveillance and authoritarianism? Or, or are we going to see this? I mean, you talked about class apartheid. I mean, it struck me uh, remembering the former UN Special Rapporteur on Poverty, uh, Philip Ashton, who talked about climate apartheid, where the poor will be left, you know, to face hunger and heat and the rich will insulate themselves in air conditioning, air conditioned places. And, and that the dystopian vision is the one that's more likely to roll out. And I, I suppose I, I, the question is, is how do you how do we tackle that populism whilst at the same time talking about internationalism? And is it possible to do both? Well, it's 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 really difficult, you know. I mean, I I remember internationalism to me, uh, you know, or universalism, separate from the idea of globalism in in my mind, you know. But I remember, um, you know, when th- there was an attempt to remember Naomi at the World Social Forum days, where there was this idea of, you know, another world is possible and so on. And I remember thinking, of course, we're saying that, but they are saying that too, you know, and their their other world has become more possible in some ways. But um, here, you you know, the, the, the World Social Forum, for example, it ended up being like, I, I, I remember seeing all the best activists had turned into travel agents, you know, like they were just having to schedule things and who's going to go where. And then within that forum, you know, you see the same the same distance growing between people fighting on the ground and then people deciding who's going to speak or who's going to get a platform. And, you know, it became it became a little microcosm of the same forms of disparity you know so so and and increasingly in in india like i i mean i i see that ultimately now if you have a coal mine or if you want to anyway mining not so much the battle for da- uh, against dams but you you know people who have actually managed to protect the land and just said you can't come you know, we're going to fight you if you come in. Have actually managed to succeed more than people who are, you know, being Gandhian or being polite or going to court because every institution has has turned against us, even now in this crisis, you know. And so right now you're seeing a situation in India where it's really hard to read because just before the COVID crisis, the whole country was in a beautiful moment of resistance against the anti-Muslim citizenship laws. And you had the most, all the young people, students, poetry, you know, it was just beautiful. And now when we are locked in, they're arresting, uh, they're arresting the students under anti-terrorism laws, holding them without bail. And the whole, the whole language, anti-Muslim language using um, corona to stigmatize Muslims. You know, the TV channels had uh, called it Corona Jihad, uh, referred to Muslims as human bombs because a meeting of the Jamaat in Nizamuddin close by turned out to be a super spreader, you know, but it mm. it was given this, this uh, very vicious uh, spin to the point where it was absolutely terrifying. And now there are, you know, Muslim vegetable vendors are boycotted, they're not allowed in. So, this, you know, the, the fight is on so many levels that, you you know, we run the risk of, uh, uh, you know, how, how do people who are just fighting for their lives, fighting to survive, how do you, I mean, some of them are not, uh, some of them are not f- fighting because uh, of a climate crisis. You know, they are fighting because of a hatred crisis or a hunger crisis. Mm-hmm. It's hard to, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to 
um, try and rally all these things and explain all these things as part of one thing, though it is one thing, mm -hmm. you know, but the desperation is so extreme, the violence is so extreme, the oppression is so extreme, the threat of, uh, you know, being picked up and put into jails where corona is spreading, uh, is, is happening to people now. So, um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult, uh, I mean, although I think it's so important to keep, keep doing what uh, Naomi, uh, what you do, which is to, which is to, to forefront the connections between all of this, because that's what, that's what you can do best as a writer, you know, um, but at the same time, you know, sometimes you just feel like you're surrounded by, by fire, you know, mm -hmm. by fire. And, and even, even uh, you know, uh, people who, who say anything, the, the threat is so imminent and so terrifying in some ways, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. It's bringing Naomi back in. Well, you know, the last time we talked about this, Asad, you, um, you and I, you pointed out that we are in this strange moment where the forces of the far right, the forces of, of, of fascism are more internationalist <laughs> than, yeah. um, than, 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 than the left. You know, because I think because of the, the, the some of the, the failures of of um, of our of our attempts of our more recent attempts at, at internationalism and 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 it's not to say that there aren't um, there aren't some doorways that have always stayed open and your work at at, at War on Want has been part of that Assad. Um, but we, but but it is tr we we have to remember that that Trump and Modi and Netanyahu and Viktor Orban and Scott Morrison, I mean, they're all trading tricks, you know, and technologies, right? A and you know, the conversations that I've had with you in recent years, Aaron Dati, about this, um, have been very harrowing for me because I do believe that there's a lot. I think that we see a migration of tactics, um, you know, we I, I, like. Where, where Israel has been using Palestinians as a laboratory for a lot of these surveillance technologies that then get sold and repackaged. Um, I think China has been a laboratory for controls of information and ways of having a high tech state while still having a controlled population. Um, what happened, I think, in India after Modi's re-election and the sort of gloves off ferociousness um, and the use of technology um, as, as, as a disciplining tool, unplugging and plugging people in, yeah. right? It's, it's very important that we have these exchanges, right? And we need to do a better job, I think, of having more of them because, um, you know, we're, we're all offering each other previews and uh, of, of what's to come. We need to learn about uh, resistance strategies that have worked, that have failed. Um, so we can't give up on internationalism. And I don't think anybody yeah, is, 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 um, is suggesting that. We need more, more of it. And I just want to stress again to those listening that this isn't just a, a teach-in. It's also a process that we really want your experiences um, and wisdom to feed into because we know how much we're, we're leaving out. Um, but last time, uh, Naomi, last time you and I met, I mean, uh, we just, we, the world has learned about lockdowns now. But mm -hmm. Kashmir had been locked down since August 5th without... I mean, for a great part, without internet, without phones, with soldiers on the street and razor wire. And you can imagine six million people being devastated in that way. And of course, much of how it was done was learned from, from, uh, from Israel and Gaza. Yeah, so they're learning from each other. You're absolutely right. But one thing, you know, I, I haven't done a good job aside of talking about, you know, the sort of radical future that we need. But I, one thing I just want to stress is I think that because we have gone into 
you know, the, the really, the, the, those fires that Arundhati is describing, and it is a really frightening moment, and we are committed to not spreading false hope. We have to be very honest about the challenges that, that, that we face and the stakes of this moment. But I do think that um, the kind of courage that we are seeing from the people who are really in the fire, whether, you know, who, who are, who, who, who are being actively sacrificed in this moment, sent, um, you know, to treat people without masks, without protective, um, basic protective equipment, because we don't respect women's care work, whether they're home care workers, whether they're working in nursing homes, um, you know, whether they're working in hospitals, um, you know, in so many ways, I think this virus has acted like a kind of a heat seeking missile that finds wherever people are being treated as refuse, as disposable, um, with lack of respect, wherever living beings are being treated that way. That's where we're seeing the outbreaks, right? In the slaughterhouses, in the, uh, in, you know, in the old age homes where our elders are being treated with such little respect, where the people who care for them are treated with such little respect, right? And so I think the pain and the complexity of this moment is that on the one hand, we see we see the system um, that just unveiled um, and 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 the lack of care and the extreme racism um, and and sexism in who is treated as disposable. But we are also seeing these outpourings of love and appreciation for the laborers who are keeping us alive and caring for us and caring for our loved ones when we can't be with them. And so I think we need to we need to build on that and we need in very concrete terms to stand with the people who are taking extreme risks in this moment, um, who are saying we will refuse to be simultaneously essential and disposable, right? And we are seeing these walkouts by Amazon workers and nurses, you know, demonstrating outside of hospitals. And and so what is the duty? You know, I was uh, I did, did an event recently with Eric Ward from the Southern, Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center. And he said the question, the only question that matters now is are liberals going to stand with workers or with capital? Um, and I think, I, you know, I don't know exactly where we are going through the portal, but I do firmly believe that it begins if we don't want it to end up in that dystopia that we've seen in every, you know, sci fi, bad sci fi movie. Um, that it begins with the with 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 those of us who have the luxury of of being offered this actually dystopian touchless life to re- first of all reject it say we hate it <laughs> that the your that, that the silicon valley utopia is actually a dystopia um, and to take real risks to stand with the people who are making our lives possible in con- whether concretely you know, boycotting the employers that are treating them as sacrificable, um, you know, and also fighting for the policies that are the difference between life and death, whether that means canceling rent, erasing medical debt, fighting for universal health care. And, uh, and all of this is building towards, you know, the vision of a, of a true global Green New Deal. And just picking up on that vision, because we've got quite a lot of questions, and thank you to everybody who's sending in questions and tweeting. Huge amount of questions, of course, asking for that. You know, what is the vision? What are the steps? And uh, we were talking earlier, and and I love that line that you have, Aaron Dutty, that, you know, this is like a, we have to undo like a thousand uh, decisions. And the knitting metaphor, you have to undo all these stitches to get where we want to get. And I, when you talked about the social forum, I remember 20 years ago, hearing both of you speaking at, in, mm-hmm. in Allegri and, and, you know, the slogan, yes, another world is possible there. And, but of course, the other slogan, one, no, many yeses. And I've always been struck by this challenge of how do you have so many yeses and at the same time build the power of the movement of movements? So what are the core transformational fights that if we were able to unstitch or stitch to a better future could be transformational. And I think we touched on some, you know, about the care economy and a universal basic income or thinking about in- environmental limits on resource use and the commons. I mean, uh, do you think that that's 
like you know having those foundational moments uh, pillars allow us to go back maybe to those 60s and 70s movements and are reading about them of at least in the Indian subcontinent when they were a roti kapramakan about food yeah. and clothing but we're able to be able to articulate a vision of the global green new deal which is populist and speaks to the moment and is able to engage the social forces that needed that are needed and and of course we all know that the climate movement one of its greatest weaknesses has been to see climate as an environmental issue and not fundamentally as an issue of justice and therefore was never able to build solidarity with the labor movement with black and minority communities etc we've got this possibility with this converging of these of, of these crises i so i i am going to throw the vision question back a little bit but ask you both about how build how we can build power because i think both of you as writers you know, talk a lot, of course, and not just chronicled, you know, human uh, experience. But I think, you know, your writings articulate, I think for many of us, you put what our soul feels, right? But you talk about the importance of being with movements. You in Namada Dam, Arundhati, uh, Niemi, back in Seattle and the WTO protest. So I, I suppose it's, it's the question of how do we build the movement of movements? but also still allow the plurality of the yeses that can sp speak to vocabularies and languages and territories. And is this the moment to be able to do it? So I don't know which one of you would like to try <laughs> that very big question uh, as we head towards the close. I think, um, you know, the truth, truthful answers, I don't know. Because there's one thing that I, I grapple with all the time, you know, which is, I think it's historically happened that it's the same thing I was saying, you know, but what is it that arouses passions and which brings people on the streets, which makes people um, really stand up and fight? And I've seen that in India, and everywhere in the world, you know, the the the, the left under the left saw it uh, in both the world wars. You know how suddenly uh, 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 international solidarity just dissolves into nationalism the minute there's a war. You know, so yeah. the the I mean here if if it's uh, if it's an issue of any kind of sectarian, ethnic, or religious uh, uh, issue, you have these fiery passions, you know, and so both, let's say Trump and Modi, they both speak directly to that, you know, and that, so, so you know, when Trump is insulting uh, that Chinese-American journalist, you know, our instinct is immediately to rally behind her, but you, you see him actually thinking, I've got another half a million people on my side because I did this, you know, of nationalist right wing mm -hmm. um, viciousness. So Modi does the same. You know, the greatest passions you've seen are. Um, I mean, he. It, it, it really, it really makes me think. Like when he announced demonetization, and he just overnight seventy per eighty percent of the currency was no longer legal tender. People, I mean, it was nothing compared to what this uh, coronavirus we handled that is, but still, people really suffered, but he managed to turn that suffering into some kind of, uh, uh, you know, into some kind of pleasure. Um, so how how is it that these these people managed to appeal to the very people who they are destroying for support. This is something that I, I mean, how is it possible in this moment of the pandemic when nothing could be more important than universal health care in the U.S., that Bernie Sanders is out of the race? And, and who, and the person who's, who's uh, got the Democratic nomination seems to be a non-person, like he has nothing to say to this moment, nothing to say. But 
why is it happening? You know, why would it be that people who who have been, uh, you know, so perhaps there's something we need to understand yeah. about mass psychology. You know, what is it that because it it's just to think that people who are hungry and without jobs and without work will rise up in revolution is a non-thought now. It's not going to happen. It doesn't happen like that, you know. So how does it happen? How how does it how how does how does that critical moment happen? You know, because here people have been hungry and and brutalized for so long, but so beautifully divided up and for, pitted against each other, you know? So we, we know, uh, uh, moving towards Nemi, uh, absolutely, we know we need to build unity. We know we need to... But how? Rest, but, 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 and, and, and counter grief with hope, right? And that's always been about a vision. Our movements have never been successful without having a vision and without having transformative political demands and without building power. So those three pillars have always been very central to us. So, um, so I, I, look, coming to, to Naomi and I, I'm trying to put that sort of suppose the vision question to you as a way of thinking about is that is do we need the vision to build power and uh, what what is this vision at this moment? What does this moment allow us to do? I mean, I do believe we need a, a, a vision of where we're going um, to light the path. I don't think, but I, but I also think we, we start with where the most critical struggles are, right? Whether it's to get people out of prison where COVID is, is, is running rampant or camps on the borders. I mean, the, 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 that vision has to be rooted in those real struggles, right? And I think that one of the, one of the, um, openings of this moment around, you know, it has us thinking about essential, what is essential, right? What, what we, we don't usually have that discussion. Um, and you can see it fading into the background quickly as we normalize um, this particular manifestation of mass death. But this isn't the first time that, that we have found ways to normalize mass death. I mean, you're in Europe where uh, thousands of people drowning in the Mediterranean was 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 was, a, was normalized in the past decade and 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 able to coexist with pleasant summer vacations, right? So we, you know, and 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 all of us who have been part of the um, battles in the climate justice movement around, you know, are we going to set the warming target at 1.5 or 2 degrees? That was always a debate about whether or not millions upon millions of people were going to lose their homelands, were going to be allowed to disappear, or whether that was going to be sacrificed in the name of getting the economy, keeping the economy growing. And so that logic is now, you know, at the very center of, of, of the, the largest economy on the planet, um, where it is now a debate about whether or not to open up nail salons, right? Um, so, so the vision, I think, comes from those those battles, um, the people who are taking the risks, the question about whether or not we're going to be um, standing on the side of the sort of ease that is being promised with this bubble world of endless streaming and endless delivery and touchlessness, or whether or not we're going to stand with those people who are being sacrificed based on the logic that there are armies of other workers to replace them. I mean, this is the, this is the, um, the, the calculation of a guy named, like Jeff Bezos, who's made $30 billion in this pandemic um, and is eliminating the hazard pay for his workers, even as the outbreaks in his warehouses continue unabated. He is just looking at the unemployment rates and going, they can quit. I'll replace them. There's no shortage of people to replace them. And that is why, you know, I come back to this challenge of, you know, what about what are those of us who are who are getting the delivery packages going to do? Right. Um, so in terms of that, you know, of course, we need a vision of the world we're, we're, we're working for. But I think that it needs to build on the experience that we're in right now. Right. What is essential? What do we 
What do we miss, right? What are we discovering is really essential in this moment? Um, I think we miss each other. I think we appreciate the natural world in this moment. You, so many people are taking solace from the fact that birdsong has, has returned. Um, and, 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 and we appreciate the labor of the, uh, of the people who are allowing us to stay alive and keeping ourselves safe. So the, the vision of the world that we want has to build on these revelations, right? It has to build on the on the fact that we can't treat people as if they're disposable, that we value, that we, we need alignment between that essential labor and the way we, um, we, 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 we value it monetarily. Um, and we also need, I think, mass decommodification, right? Um, I mean, one of the things that scares me the most about this, vision that Silicon Valley is, is selling to us and is so being so rapidly normalized as we move everything online is that all of it, we are the mind site, you know, our data is the mind site. Um, it doesn't replace the real mind sites, but it is another mind site. Every, every, all of our relationships are as we move online, as, as, as our social relations move to zoom calls, um, and social media platforms, and our kids are learning online and medicine has moved online. All of it is extractable, right? So I think we need a radical movement of decommodification, um, which isn't to say that we don't use technology, but we have to refuse uh, the idea that it is, um, it, is the, it is the new site of endless extraction and commodification where our most intimate relationships are um, are, are repackaged and sold as, as, um, as, as data. So, uh, I mean, these are just a few ideas. Obviously, none of us have the answers. And I think the whole idea behind this process, right, that we're kind of kicking off here and that has been building over a year is that it needs to be a weaving of the collective vision. Because even though we have these critiques of everywhere we've gone wrong and all of our fuck ups and kicking ourselves and lost opportunities and shut doors. The fact is we do have, we've been doing some work, right? Um, over these centuries and decades and months and years. And there are groups like Via Campesina, for instance, that have woven an international network of small farmers, um, you know, and, 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 and who have a vision for what food security and sovereignty and land redistribution should look like in this moment. We aren't starting from scratch. And you can look, you know, at the decarceration movement or the feminist movement and see so many of these ideas out there. So I think as frustrated and fearful as we are and as much as we feel those lost opportunities and moments, um, we can't lose sight of all of this work. And I th think that we need to see our... Our challenge is one, you know, we're, we, you know, it's it's the disaster capitalists that crave the blank sheet. They always talk about a blank slate, right? This moment has created a blank sheet, a blank slate for us to, you know, build our fantasy world. I think our, ours should be the opposite. We have there are no blank sheets, there are no blank pages. Um, we need to be weaving together all of this collective vision that has been um, percolating and and that has been salvaged and saved into something that we can. Um, really be inspired by and that can be that can be a beacon for us so we're, we're rapidly coming towards the end and I maybe just to build on that because I think one of the challenges I think for all of us when we we're out there is always this question you know uh, what steps and I think we all say look we have to recognize we're in an arc of struggle right and that the that we build on where our movements have demanded and our, our, the, this moment of crisis of leaving nobody behind requires us to be able to weave the demands of our movements together to build power from the bottom upwards to be able to articulate a vision because we know no transformation has ever taken place without having a coherent vision about a world that we want but it also recognizing that that takes fights and that means political demands and it means building power we can begin to you know construct some of those we know you know, we have to undo the logic of sacrifice that has been permeated through the last 500 years of, of slavery to colonialism and to climate crisis and, and still is in the climate crisis and the logic in the global north of its net and zero. And war. 
<laughs> absolutely, and war and, co and, and, and militarization. Um, we have to undo the logic that says, you know, uh, uh, that some people are, uh, whose lives are worthless. And we, we know that that reality exists in the global north and the global south. We have some challenges that we recognize, you know, there is a ticking bomb because of the climate crisis. We have to keep temperatures well below 1.5. We know that has to be done fairly. And that means glo the global north needs to be cutting to its missions to zero by 2030. That's a massive transformation. We know that and that's a huge challenge to make sure that that transition is a just transition. But we know we also need a justice transition to the global south. That means, you know, going again, the demands of our movements about the commons of land, food, energy and water being owned by people with environmental limits, shared fairly. I mean, it's a, it mu we have to have in much bigger conversations about what is energy for, what is productive energy, how much energy should we be using and what for. And, and we know that we can never win this without guaranteeing people economic equality. And that really does mean building with the power of the labor movements and, and fighting not for a living wage in our own nation state, I'm always reminded that the banners of the union movements never say workers of the UK or the US unite. They say workers of the world unite. And I think there's an importance of bringing that worker solidarity and class back into this fight and by talking about universal living wage, by talking about so the right to social protection for everybody around the world, of universal public services, health, education, housing, and making these really fundamental. And, and uh, whilst I agree with Aaron Dutty, you know, we can't, reduce these to simply a human rights frame. I'm always struck that many of these demands are, of course, written into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 71 years ago. The question has always been about the power to deliver them. And, and we know that that power doesn't come by simply imposing from the top down. And that's why this project has, has very much been about a collaboration, about weaving and building together movements, thinkers, communities and frontline resistance, and being able to develop collectively what that framework is and that involves all of you people listening and i really urge you to go go to the www.globalgnd.org and sign up and be part of this because the 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 the, the simple answer to the question what is the vision isn't you know any of us it's in all of us collectively the answer what is the solution how do we change the world isn't in each of us individually it's in us collectively and only through this project where we're trying to say what is the conceptual framework what is the policy transformation fight and how are we building power do we have this possibility of actually going through the portal and leaving nobody no one behind and i think there are real challenges for the climate movement because whilst it's done amazing i think in the last 18 months in the global north largely because of an existential fear as it's seen the climate crisis hit the global north i think there are also we have to be thinking much more about that redistribution of wealth you know i'm always struck you know when people here in the global north say we don't have money to help on the climate crisis and that was the answer after the austerity you know we have to deal with our national problems and now we're already hearing it about the recession saying any demands of redistribution of wealth from the global north and the global south is just politically impossible and then you have to remind people that britain during the raj took 45 trillion out of india alone that literally the global south has built the global north, that the trillions that flow in illicit tax flows and capital flows from the south to the north are what allows the north that resilience to be able to deal with these corona pandemic and even think about how it adapts to the ongoing climate crisis. And so, yes, we should cancel global debt, but I think we actually need to move the conversation on to what does reparations in this moment look like and how? And that's not about reparations from the poorest to the poor, from the north to the south. I think it's about reparations from the state and thinking about what does it mean to, for our global financial our trading system, our global economy. You know, often I think all of us have been in movements where the demand from the global south is if there's one thing that you can do is we're resisting is take your foot off our neck. And that means tackling the corporations and the businesses and the banks that are domiciled in your country. Don't simply expect struggle and revolution and change to come from the global south. We are we are fighting for change, but we need a truly inspirational movement on the outside. So I um, really thank everybody who's been part. Again, thank you very much to Leap, War and Want, Haymarket. 
a huge appreciation to our two distinguished guests, Aaron Dutty and Naomi. This is really only the beginning of a conversation. It's one in the beginning of a series of, of webinars that will be then unpacking all of these particular issues. So really sign up, be part of the discussion, help us develop what this Global Green New Deal is. And I think really together we can build the power to make another world possible. Thank you for everyone who joined this call. Really hope to see you at future events. And I really apologize we weren't able to get to everybody's questions. Uh, there are many questions that I would think we could spend the whole night, hopefully, and maybe in one moment in the future, we will all be back together again and having deep and long, profound conversations face to face. Thank you to everybody. Um, and thank you. And I think we'll sign off now. <laughs>